three, two, one. Hi everyone. Thanks for joining us for lunch break today. I'm Carrie. Today we're talking with artist Joe Yarrington. Joe is based in New York and is a professor at Fairfield University. From installation art to photography and glass work, she explores light, perception, and the senses. Her recent work has focused on environmental issues and the relationship between language and image. She was in Sci Art's 2018 exhibit, Infinite Potentials, and also participated in our Bridge Residency Program. We're so happy to have her here today and get to know more about her work. If you have questions throughout this talk, you can type them into the Q&A box on Zoom and we'll get to those at the end. So to start off, can you tell us about the mediums you use and what your work focuses on? Yeah, thank you, Carrie. And also thank you, Julia, just talking to her. I really appreciate the opportunity to put this all together and to you know use it to kind of relook at work, especially a 40 year career um, and try to distill it in a shorter amount of time. So I'm hoping I'll, uh, I'll, I'm going to be able to do that in a way that you could understand. Um, I think coming into, I just want to talk about the venue of SciArt. It's a very specific venue for asking questions and presenting uh, impressions uh, or responses and a kind of art science bridge. Um, and I really enjoyed being in the exhibition Infinite P Potentials and also as a participant in the collaborative uh, bridge res uh, residency with um, a scientist from uh, uh, Flint um, and uh, uh, um, and also, she was also in chemistry as well. So um, that was really interesting to spend four months uh, doing a back and forth and then having an exhibition at the end of that. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit as we, I go forward. Um, her, and by the way, her name is Amansi Rabago-Smith. Um, and, and I'll refer to her a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit later. Um, I'm going to present work in um, three parts. Um, I'll take about five minutes to distill 40 years of a backstory. <laughs> so I'm hoping I'm gonna be able to do that. Um, five minutes to discuss current work, focus on the environment, uses of uranium, which has been a primary focus for a couple of years. And two minutes to discuss um, where you can see my work and um, I'll discuss where that is. Um, uh, I wanna start with the first part of that and um, I'm gonna kind of move this forward, the slides forward as I talk. Um, two questions uh, from anyone that can cause me angst is, where are you from? And also what kind of artwork do you do? Um, I grew up as an army brat, so where I'm from, I don't even know how to answer that. Everywhere, no place, you know, all of that. So I think that's informed a lot of the kind of work I'm doing and what kind of artwork artwork do you do is all I wish I were landscape uh, painter because I think at least someone would have a vision of what that would look like so uh, I'm going to kind of answer that second question now um, uh, in terms of a backstory of my work uh, curiosity is kind of leading my artwork uh, for the most part and it's varying responses to phenomena and I think looking back over 40 years, um, I had four questions I think I was posing. You know, where, uh, where's light and can I hold it? You can sort of see the slides that mark that. And these are little, you know, to the side sort of experiments as I'm doing that. Um, what is space and can I mark it? What is time and can I suspend it? And what is being and can I define it? So those are questions I think that have taken me through uh, a number of different materials and a number of directions. And, but I think it's, and it's a lifetime search. So it's not gonna be something where I'm gonna answer it definitively, but it's piqued my interest, all of those, as I move through my work. Um, the search for those answers is, is um, I'm always looking for the lens actual or metaphoric through which we perceive the world around us. And this is Louise Bourgeois piece. I just love that because it's all about looking <clears throat> through a lens into an interior space and maybe being on the outside looking in or on the inside perhaps looking out. And I love that back and forth with her work. 
Um, I think the artwork for me functions has notations on that perception. Um, it's also that searches to become aware of patterning, correlations, categorizing, and indexing, and to seek the liminal, the space in between. And what you're looking at is kind of early work. I took a lot of slides, and I really liked the fact that I could move back and these slides would become bigger and bigger. And, you know, I started to think about the way light passes through uh, images or is used to activate images. Um, which led me, after some reading of, I'm going to just talk a little bit about that, Lewis Kahn and his de definition of architecture has this threshold between silence, light, Proust, and his ruminations on the unfettered space between sleeping and waking, a suspended freedom in the glide between unconsciousness and consciousness. So very hard things to try to do, I think, with artwork. Also Charlotte Bronte and Villette, uh, she speaks about her shadow land and interior space of refuge and boundless possibilities. And McEwen in atonement, the fertile pause between stillness and motion. So I think that early reading, um, this is a, uh, a sanctuary in Cologne. This was around um, 2002. I, I was starting to work with Duraclears and sort of looking, uh, using those to kind of hold photographic images and playing with scale and embedding those images has transparent uh, pieces within architecture. I moved after, I'm skipping a lot through this, but I'll go, we're going to the, just the high points of, of sort of the work that I've done, but a lot of my work is more about space and environment. This is at the De Cordova Museum. I think that the work in sanctuaries, which was in Rome and Scotland and also St. John the Divine and a number of other places uh, with a group of people that I was working with at the time, uh, led me when I came to the De Cordova Museum to kind of think of the De Cordova layout has the rose window, um, which you can see with a finger kind of touching, uh, you know, this flower and it's kind of uh, embedded, I'll show a little close up of that later, uh, uh, the, almost touching a flower and also the finger kind of embedded in a, um, a web. Um, on the side, you can see there was, a, there was a glass encased elevator, which I thought sounded like a kind of ritualistic something or other where the hand would go up and down based on who was in the elevator. So I like that activation. And on this, and this is actually that front uh, image, uh, a couple of slides that I put together. Um, and also the side image, which again, made me think of a sanctuary and, and sort of luminous, um, almost like uh, luminous manuscripts, let's say that, that are, um, uh, that tell a kind of story. Um, so I was really playing with light and consciousness on this and using a, a kind of light in, in a dark room to photograph drawing with, with light and, um, you know, making that some, it, was it a dream? Is it reality? So they were kind of private performances. Um, during, you saw that at night in the last slide. So in the day, um, the light would come in and because there was a wall very close, it would project onto the wall. So thinking about the slide projections, using architecture as a kind of vehicle, like a slide projector, um, in a very big way to, to put it in service, let's say, to the work and to the phenomena of light and sunlight and um, uh, the tracking of light. Um, this led me to um, also, again, I do a lot of, I'm going to take a small sip of water. Um, this led me to really think about the function of the eye. So, um, you know, I, was, I had a residency in a, and part of it was in a barn. So I was thinking, I wonder, like a camera obscura, this little hole would project the images from outside, kind of like your eye functions where you are taking in um, exterior phenomena and uh, through, through your eye and optic nerve, it's translating into an upside down backwards uh, image, which your brain makes sense out of. So I began to think about how you use your body as a kind of way of perceiving. And um, this is a print that I was working on at the time. You're looking on the left at a retinal scan of my eye which is kind of interesting. I was also traveling to Iceland and doing a lot of international traveling. 
Um, on the left is a geyser from Iceland. On the right is a retinal scan, another type of retinal scan of my eye. And I really like the correlation between the ge geography of the earth and also the geography of the way of mapping my own body to try and understand it. Um, this is a retinal scan of my eye and you're seeing the optic nerve, which, you know, for those of us who make our living from uh, understanding visual stimuli and visual information, it's amazing to kind of see how that travels to our brain. Um, from there, I went into, I was working with Topcon, which is a, a retinal scanning company. Uh, I cold called them and said, I'm an artist and I'm interested in working with you and doing something that was a, a bridge between art and science. They were very interested. First time an artist had actually approached them. So um, I took this retinal scan, thinking of it as a map, a kind of planetary map, I suppose, um, into which uh, I, I was placed on the windows of the Aldrich Museum. This was in 2010. Um, you're seeing uh, uh, my retinal scan uh, kind of has an entry into the, this museum of looking and seeing. Uh, on the side, you're kind of looking at uh, the, a kind of movable grid uh, that was presented in monitors. And at the other end, um, you could see, because there was glass at both sides uh, as you moved into the foyer, um, this was kind of an overview of pigment. And I thought how interesting that it looked like a, uh, an iris or like your eyes overhead shot. So I like that idea of our eyes sort of moving into materials. Um, and also in the Aldrich Museum, I, because I was interested in the camera obscura, um, they have a camera obscura there. So I embedded very small uh, videos that uh, were tracking how your eye adjusts to light and also the camera obscura. So that was, very interesting, a two-year project, very interesting to have that happen. Um, I'm moving along. This is 40 years of work, so I'm gonna to try to do this, you know, quickly. But this is at Grounds for Sculpture, and, you know, using that same idea of, I loved, um, and I wanna thank my, the curator at the time, Virginia Steele, for inviting me to explore this work and really be able to, and also the curator, uh, Rachel Lafoe at the De Cordoba Museum, I should have mentioned her as well. But I was using this as a way to hold time. This was a, you know, coming down to do this piece. I was looking at the history of how this building on the New Jersey fairgrounds was used originally before it became a museum for the grounds for sculpture. So I would come down from New York. And so what you're seeing on the stands are, it, are me photographing my train trip down to complete this piece. On the side uh, also is a kind of journeying um, and uh, the, the building itself does become a kind of vehicle for projection. Um, along with all of this, everything's happening concurrently, but I had a residency at the Museum of Glass and I thought maybe I'll make an eyeball or something like it. So I was starting to really look at the idea of light passing through something I made, uh, not just a window, but glass that I made, and what happens with the mechanics of all of that. Um, and this uh, last piece um, for you know what was before is, this is the Citywide Open Studios in New Haven. This is at the Joff um, Armory uh, in 2014, and it was uh, more of a, a sun calendar, what you're seeing on the floor are um, mirrors. So when the sun would come in and hit the mirrors, the light would bounce up to the ceiling. It's also a place to contemplate your connection between um, this mediating force or mediating object, which was the glass and also the window itself and also out into the sun. So I uh, love the idea of that and this gives a little bit more of a close up to that. Um, and a framing for it. And I think the last piece is, I began to be really interested in these pieces, which I'd made during the residency, over two residencies at the Museum of Glass. And I started to think, you know, it looks like, I was trying to get them to look like using soda to look like irises. So I, w I was thinking, you know, it'd be really interesting to try to capture that, that light, that time, that shadowing, and how would I do that? So um, 
it led me to the next, <laughs> which is current work. I don't know if you'd like to hear about that next, but. Yeah, great. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. I know it's hard to give an overview of all that you've done, but that's a really nice glimpse into it. Okay, um, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, this, uh, and again, yeah, I'm, I hope I'm not going too fast, but people can ask questions at the end, perhaps. Um, I started to collaborate a lot at this point. I became interested in um, nuclear energy, the use of uh, uranium, um, you know, has it uh, related to the environment? There's, I have a lot of backstory on this, but I'll move forward with this. This was actually at, I was working, um, I was collaborating with um, two artists, um, Morgan Post and Sam Dole, um, who I still collaborate with both of them on different levels, but um, we spent some time looking at um, this is actually uh, called odd the exhibition was called odd volumes and Then that was the bigger exhibition that was it was with art space and Yale University Art Gallery and that was in 2014 and the title was containment and spillage and it was really exploring the history of the use of uh, nu nuclear energy in Connecticut, what was happening with nuclear waste, um, really looking, exploring it more than at that point making a statement. We visited um, uh, the power plants when you could still get in, you can't anymore. And we actually worked together to make this um, magic lantern projector, um, which you can see from the side, we made our own slides. You're also looking at, um, uh, photogra photographs on the side of sites that we visited which are made with uranium and at this point I started to use uranium glass which you're seeing in the side piece of this projector. Uh, part of it's filled with water which we took on site, part of it is soil which we uh, took on site. So we really were looking at this, I'm not saying cabinet of curiosities, it's more like um, um, it, it's kind of a vehicle for discussion um, this particular piece the thing that it was a book odd volumes is about the book which this isn't quite but we wanted it to break down into pages and each component you can see on the left hand side has uh, the, it's green and it also had like green sort of stained glass windows in this space which the whole space was painted white so it had a very sort of antiseptic uh, image but you can uh, see the green a little bit of the glass that we were using as well. So that use of uranium glass started a whole uh, long story, but um, started a whole uh, long in complicated uh, interest in the uses of uranium. Um, this was in Odetta Gallery um, in uh, 2018 in B Bushwick. Um, this was called Ghost Girls. Um, you might also know them as Radium Girls. They, they worked in factories and they used to take the brushes and dip them into radioactive paint to make it luminous for soldiers. Um, dials on soldiers' watches during World War I and World War II and because people didn't tell them or they knew about it but kept it secret that it was um, uh, radioactive, uh, the, the uh, uh, young women who worked in these factories uh, started to get cancer and uh, had very severe problems and led into kind of a, a workers' rights uh, lawsuit, uh, which I found really um, amazing. Uh, I wanted to I have the images as they are coming in. I'm going to go back two slides. The images are on the window, so it has the sun tracked around this building it spilled on the sidewall and then onto the floor. So again, that capturing of time uh, is a theme that I'm interested in. That led me to look at using uranium glass again. So I was looking at uranium glass and decals. I wanted to explore the history of the atomic bomb, continue my interest in uranium. And I um, received a residency at the, um, uh, Museum of American Glass in New Jersey uh, to your residency and I developed a piece called Uranium Game and uh, I went to the Truman Museum. I went to Paris to look at Marie Curie's radioactive journals. Um, I went to 
um, abandon uh, uranium mines in, uh, in Utah uh, to de de explore and develop this piece. Uh, this is after a lot of work. These are the 92 um, elements uh, that are in uranium and, in, and as, you, uh, as you put black light on them, they became luminous. Uh, this was part of an exhibition with seven other artists called uh, Emanations 2019 at the Museum of American Glass. And you can see the history is kind of embedded within these orbs, these glass orbs. Um, so it was it just, well, it hasn't come down yet, but it was put on suspension, but it was over at the, in December in 2019. And this is a last piece to Marie Curie's signature. Um, <clears throat> Along with this, I became curious about the artifacts left behind in the 1940s and 50s by the miners that worked in these abandoned mines, who many of whom developed cancer. Also, we went to the Navajo Nation, um, also a high cancer rate. This was south of uh, uh, Moab, Utah. So I collected, these are from the tins that the miners used to eat the food. Not a good thing to do if you're around uranium or to breathe it in, to in ingest it in any way. So I wanted to, I collected these um, and I um, wanted to use them as a kind of ghostly artifact um, and um, started to do photograms using um, uranium in what's called uranotype prints, which were developed in the mid 1800s. So there are a couple of images of that. And I loved the feel of these and what they captured um, about how I felt uh, about the lack of concern for the safety for workers in general. Um, this is shifting. This is happening concurrently, but along with the uranotypes, I was also starting to work with cyanotypes. Um, I went on a, a Mountain Lake Biology Lab um, fellowship. I uh, unearthed, which started in a uh, University of Virginia, started in 1939, and up in their attic, they had some old scientific uh, glass equipment. And so I began to think of the vehicle for scientific discovery. I wanted to capture that. So I started to make these large cyanotypes. Um, and basically you make them by uh, coating the paper with a chemical, light receptive chemical solution. Then you, in this case, I was stacking up domestic items, which then gave you something that looked very scientific, but came from another source. This is them, this is the exposures in the bath um, being developed. I also began to look at a variety of different kinds of things that I wanted to capture. At this point, I was uh, full into the residence, virtual residency with uh, Dr. Robago Smith. And she was working, her research as a chemist was the antitoxin properties of tea. So um, she said, well, let's start there. So I brewed some tea, different tea that I found in the kitchen, left it for two weeks and mold started to happen, which she said, I've never really seen that happen before. So, you know, she was kind of intrigued. Um, so, you know, it was kind of looking down into these glasses as a kind of filled with, with tea and then seeing this whole atmosphere happen uh, inside or this whole sort of, um, you know, process happening inside these glass containers. Um, I also was looking at the flow patterns of tea. I, mean, I had a visitor, this little cricket <laughs> came in. So I thought for scale, you can see that. And also, you know, what was naturally in the tea, how it would flow out, um, what the response was to that. So the absorbency, um, which uh, Dr. Rubago Smith and I were talking about throughout our, you know, weekly discussions as I was, at this time on sabbatical and in different residencies in the Virginia Center for, uh, uh, Virginia Center for Creative Arts and also Anderson Center in Minneapolis. So along with the tea, we were looking again through another lens through the microscope. Um, what were the properties? How do, you, how do you define those? From there, it led to some found glass objects at, um, that were made by another resident there who was working with glass and um, I started to use these found objects which uh, he was going to throw away or discard and use them as a lens to 
has a photogram kind of lens to record uh, what you didn't say, what was unseen in this uh, in these. And I loved that sense that they had, you couldn't tell exactly what they were. Um, also, this is some more of the stacking of domestic items, again, giving that idea of more science based. Um, this is something that was an in infinite potentials. Um, this is uh, about an exploration on stem cells, but it, in actuality, it came from um, coverings for a lamp um, and some other things I had around and, you know, a bowl and all of that, but I loved that sense of series and narrative that that presented. Yeah, um, we'll be wrapping up pretty soon. So if you can just give us also, make sure to let us know where we can see your work and how we can keep up with what you're doing. Uh, yeah, I think I'm trying to advance uh, to the next slide and I don't know why I can't do that. So let's see if I can get back on. Oops, there we go. Um, this was just some work in China. Uh, looking at uh, uh, piano rolls, looking at language, how light uh, was transposed um, through uh, sound. So the interplay of that, this is Morse code of some words. And this is what I'm doing now. <laughs> so we're getting to that, I'm almost there. Um, so I'm in my apartment as we all are. So on my, I have a windowsill. So all, I don't use a lot of plastic containers, but I've used some throughout um, my time in the last month and a half. So I'm starting to architecturally build up um, uh, these towers and I'm looking at the way they track light. And I love the architecture of this, very simple um, as I'm going through uh, and I'll move pretty fast, don't have too many of these. Also the use of color, introducing that, things I had around the house, the closeness of that, the scale. And I started to think about weaving. And um, this is a little lace piece that I did at the uh, Folk Art Museum. And we're at the last slide. Uh, now I'm kind of look at at looking at lace cards, which remind me of piano rolls and also the found lace that I have. And I want to make cyanotypes. So just I'm kind of prepping for that and trying to think about what they actually mean to me. So that's it. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate it. These are beautiful and uh, inspiring to see how you're still creating while at home. Um, I, think I, I don't think I have a choice. I think as, as artists, it's like, well, I'm either going to cook or do, you know, make something out of what I have around mm -hmm. me. So I'm not much of a cook. So I think I'm moving in this direction. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, this is Julia coming in to uh, manage the Q&A portion of your talk. Um, it's great to see what you're up to now as it relates to, you know, what, what you've been doing for the last 40 years. I definitely <laughs> see a few common threads. Um, yes, I do too. So that helped for me to go through everything. <laughs> yeah, hindsight is great like that. Um, so we have a question about your uranium glass piece and just how it was made because obviously it has that you know appearance of being radioactive and we're assuming that it's not actually radioactive but that glow that you get um, um how it's like it's pieces? well it's slightly radioactive and actually i worked in in concert with um a glass maker at the museum of american glass uh it's sweet arts has a glass facility so the residency for two years uh, has been there. They were, they wanted to use uranium. They've been using it very safely. There's not a, a huge percentage, but it's enough to spark some, you know, emissions, uh, especially with uh, black light. Um, but, you know, uranium was also used to make depression, green depression glass in the 1930s. So, you know, there are <laughs> things that we eat off of that also emit radioact very low but radioactive waves and also will spark in black light like that they'll they'll move into a, a, that kind of glowy green um, quality with black light oh that's so interesting i had no idea <laughs> um <laughs> i learned a well, lot too <laughs> i i bet yeah and it makes you <laughs> makes you think every time you see something glowing green like that <laughs> um but so fascinating. Thank you so much. That is all the time that we have for questions today, but that was really wonderful. Thanks again.
Thank you, Julia, and thank you, Carrie, for this. It's great. Thank you. Um, thanks for everyone who tuned in. Our next lunch break will be Friday, May 1st at 1 p.m. with Kate Schwarting. Um, so hope to see you there. And you can join our mailing list at sciartinitiative.org to stay up to date on what we're doing. Thank you so much, Joe. See you next time. Thank you, Carrie. Bye-bye.